Transformers, The Covenant of Primus, by Justina Robson. First published, 2013, by 47 North. Chapter 2. The Expulsion of Unicron. Our great task was not something we could simply get up and go to. We didn't know ourselves well enough, and we didn't know our enemy. In that, at least, we had help. Because Unicron was an exact duplicate of Primus in every way except for the frequency of his energy systems, we knew how he was made and what he was able to do. The Covenant also released the recorded memories of their past battles to study. So, after the day of our making, we rapidly settled down to discovering how our abilities might work, singly and together, and we analysed the past, looking for clues as to how we could approach him. It was soon obvious that we were divided, naturally, into three groups. The first were the warriors, Prima, Vector, Megatronus, Onyx, Amalgamus. The second were the strategists, Alpha Trion, Quintus, Liege Maximo, and Micronus. The last were the free agents, Alchemist, Solus, Nexus, and Thirteen. They were capable of battle, but also had other qualities that made them suited to more subtle forms of warfare than direct assault. We harboured no illusions that there would be more than one aspect to the war. Our greatest ally was surprise. If we failed at the first attempt, it was likely Unicron would more than match us at any second meeting, once he had a chance to contemplate our existence. After our initial tests were over, we had Solus construct a virtual copy of Unicron. When we were not engaged in the gathering of materials or the practising of various arts, we assembled at the hollow suite she had built for us to study him and attempted various plots against him as a game. We tested everything to exhaustion. In our quiet periods of rest, we talked over the nature of the problem, and as our understanding grew, one thing overall became clear. We could not kill Unicron. He was orders of magnitude in excess of us, for one thing. We felt doubtful that anything would be his undoing, short of burying him in the heart of a star to be fusioned out of existence. And that task was beyond us. Quintus fancifully suggested that since entropy was his thing anyway, the trick would be to increase his order, uh, not try to destroy him, but we had no clue how that would be done, or if it made sense. Quintus... Alchemist and Onyx did have a very strong and believable conviction, however, that even if we were capable of ending Unicron, that would probably also be the end of Primus, and, by extension, all of us. To extinguish such a massive element of it, however repellent we might find it, would be to kill us all. In the past we knew that Primus had attempted to reabsorb Unicron, but had failed. Unicron was having none of it. So this avenue was also closed to us. The best we could hope for would be to force Unicron into the same hibernating state as Primus had willingly taken on himself. This way, although he could continue to survive, he would at least not be taking any active roles. Better too that this were done before he spawned his own set of independent dark primes, although Micronus judged him too egotistical for that. What? and give his power away to lesser mortals? I don't think so. Megatronus, knowing Unicron's tendencies, best agreed. Prima pulled a face, and then the two of them began to argue back and forth until the rest of us drifted away. Megatronus was a difficult person to be around, tormented deep down, knowing that he represented in large part what we mostly held to be an anathema. He particularly loathed Prima as if Prima had stolen his rightful place. But he had his friends, Onyx, Maximo, and Alchemist. They kept him in balance, and though he expected rejection for the more savage of his ideas, he didn't find much of that. Solus smiled on him, and made him the first set of dark Energon skins, armour we would wear for the conflict to protect us from the corrupting energies of Unicron's aura. She also agreed, after much discussion and doubtful considerations, to craft him a special weapon, the Requiem Blaster, a gun that drew on the hearts of distant stars to power its plasma beam. Nothing could stand against it. She felt that it was necessary at last for our fight against Unicron, but its overwhelming power seemed to take it into a dimension beyond the rest of us. 
With it in his hand, Megatronus could threaten us all, if he wished to. She didn't say this in so many words. It was Maximo who said it aloud, in his honest but unnerving way of coming out with an uncomfortable truth. So, Megatronus sneered, hurt pride cutting him as deep as the blaster would have, you don't trust me enough to let me have it, is that it? Solus stood her ground, considering, and she held his gaze. They looked into each other's eyes for many silent minutes, taking measures none of us could fathom. Finally, she nodded slowly. I do trust you, she said. It is the weapon itself that I do not trust. All weapons have only one purpose, to kill and to harm. This weapon is so great in its presence, so pure in intent, that I fear for your safety, Megatronus. Such things exert a force all their own upon the minds of those who carry them. But of all of us, perhaps you are the greatest warrior, because you fight all the time within yourself, and you have stood against your demons. I will make the gun as you requested it. I trust you to remain its master. I would not have you fall to the tyranny of its promises. Megatronus was proud of that speech she made, which showed her care and her esteem of him. He was so happy and grateful to be recognised thus. He loved her for it, with absolute loyalty and unswerving admiration. Being allowed to feel so special publicly brought out his sweet side too, which was charming. It also made Maximo terribly jealous, though he tried to hide it under a lot of rationalising. That didn't fool Megatronus. It simply pleased him further that he had outdone Maximo, had outdone even Prima, and was worth envying. I think that was the seed of our destruction, right there. But most of us were too busy that we didn't pay much attention to it. Such personal things had to be put aside in the service of the task. As the warriors practised the use of their weapons, they also requested the manufacture of many others. Most of these were intended to be disposable. Like our shields and armouring, they were made to counter certain abilities we had seen Unicron employ in the past, to destabilise particular alloys, to disrupt energy beams, to nullify frequency fields, and so forth. Some, however, needed to be more powerful. Among these was the Cyber Calibre, a two-handed sword made lovingly for Nexus to wield, either in one piece or in five separate sections as short swords. These later pieces were odd blades, carvers and slicers that doubled as other tools for the healing or dismantling of Cybertronian organisms. The forge of Solus Prime rang day and night to build these things. She was tireless, and when not actively working, she spent long downtime cycles, deep in conversation with Nexus and Amalgamus, or Onyx, trying to ferret out the skills to see if she could make things that possessed some of their powers. Micronus became a good friend to them, to Solus in particular. He could often be seen riding on the top of her head or one of her shoulders as she worked. He would augment her hammer strikes when she asked him, and so much of our gear was made so much stronger. Although that aspect of her work went well, it took much longer than we thought to craft a battle plan that had a chance of success. We became experts at tag-team play as we figured out how to allow the warriors of the squad to survive Unicron's initial assaults, leaping in and out of battle as the scoreboard figures that detailed our health losses and gains in each encounter plunged up and down in sickly sine waves before flatlining. Only Vector proved an expert in manoeuvres, but then he was the only one capable of teleporting himself into the far reaches of the solar system we inhabited and playing dodge and duck with asteroids in the swirling belt of rocks beyond our fifth planet. Most of the time, we were wiped in under ten cycles. We didn't require any great analyst to tell us that this wasn't going to be long enough to plug a jack into him, let alone ferret through his insides to a point where we could access his neural net. In fact, his schematic was so complex and his mind so devious that Solus, Quintus, Micronus and I had to halt simulations in order to build a computer capable of running all of his possible responses at a speed that was at least realistic. Thus we crafted the first version of what would later become Vector Sigma, 
and set it up to parallel process every option in random sequences, just so we could witness the true horror of what Unicron might be like on a good day. As it turned out, on a good day, he could own all of us in two and a half cycles. His combination of degrading aura, multiple stuns, shocks, disruption waves and physical assaults required micro-precision timing just to endure, let alone get in any shots of our own. After a particularly long day, Primer flung down the Star Saber in exasperation on the hollow plate and roared, Does this thing have no weak points? It cannot be this difficult! Megatronus looked up at him from his defeated position on his back a few metrons off. Don't get your circuits in a twist, old man. We'll get him. Just needs a little finesse. Liege Maximo, who had been watching from the sidelines, agreed, It's very unlikely he will hit you at his optimal sequence, since he has no idea who any of you are or what you are doing. But if he does, we're going to be junked without hitting a blow, Amalgamus said, thoughtful, his red-lined readouts visible across his chest as he shifted around restlessly, making and unmaking bolt cutters out of his feet. Actually, Maximo said, I think we need to create some combination of moves of our own, not just standing around hacking in whatever way we can. And he went on to sketch out some clever ideas that he had to explain a few times because of their complexity. You can practice these sets of moves, then have a code word for each one, and whoever is first to see his reactions can call the shots, and we save the big moves for the end, because once he sees them, he'll have the idea to use them too. Uh, whatever we can do, he can do, if he figures it out. He glanced up pointedly. That means you keep your plans hidden. Vector especially. No space-time finagling until the opportune moment. Vector frowned but nodded, seeing the logic. Onyx helped him up from where he had been flung by the machine's very gentle simulation of Unicron's repulsion bolt. Be long, night, Onyx said. Study hard. Remember order. He shook his heavy, quilled head. Mental tasks were hard for him. He much preferred to rely on his own instincts rather than any plan. I copied out Maximo's plans carefully for the records, and saw that they were distributed for later study. Then I withdrew from that day's practice, weary and trying not to be despondent. Only thirteen seemed unbowed. He was never downcast, no matter what obstacles seemed to have been put in his way. He accepted reality for what it was, and he worked on it, thoughtfully if he could. If not, he let it alone, and found a more productive way of helping out. Now he smiled, as if someone had given him Unicron's personal shutdown sequence. Maximo has good ideas, he said, studying the handouts. It is very clever. I think he is really on to something. Maybe Unicron isn't that clever, I said, not hoping for it too much. Maybe a little. He has spent a long time on his own without anyone to worry him, Thirteen said. He will not be at his best, and he is used to fighting Primus, not a crew of smaller, shiftier opponents. We will make it. Nexus and Alchemist think they know how to initiate cerebral shutdown, same as Primus did for himself. But whether Unicron likes it or not, come and see. His enthusiasm was dauntless. We walked across to a second simulation suite, set up like a strange skeleton radiating lights into the Cybertronian night, as if built up on images of Unicron's internal works. Many sights within him were illuminated, and once we had greeted one another, Nexus explained that these were all locations where many of his primary system functions could be disabled, even if only briefly, by the use of explosives, toxins, or jamming circuits. The free agent team will have the job of attempting to simultaneously assault these nodes, he said carefully, labelling each one with the name of an agent. None of them will be that effective alone, but together they will stun him for a short time. Some of those are far below the surface, Thirteen said, poking about in the schematic with interest. How will we get there? We have an idea about that, Nexus smiled, but it's a secret for now until we test it out. The important part 
is that one of us will have to do the actual shutdown. The rest, outside or inside, are merely decoys. Solus looked on, thinking. I should stay outside, I think. I can fix and repair the warriors there. We need you on the inside, Alchemist said, pointing. We need you to use the forge to cripple him whenever he tries to change his tactics and keep going. The others will have to look after themselves. He paused, and we all glanced at one another. Nobody had said anything about coming back. I realised that this wasn't something factored into any of the plans so far. So, if we fail? If we fail, then... Nexus shrugged. Right. So how do we win? Thirteen asked, discarding failure without a second thought. Who is this icon meant to be? He pointed at a little moat next to Unicron's spark chamber. That's you, Alchemist said rather proudly, as if unveiling a master plan. I thought Thirteen was meant to stay out of the line of fire, I said, feeling sure this was Primus's intention. If there was a later, he would be essential. Well, he is and he isn't, Alchemist continued. He's not in actual danger there, unless you count being that close to so much dark energon condensed. That's the point. The spark in Thirteen here is nearly identical to that of Primus himself. Its energon frequency is the exact opposite waveform of Unicron's spark. We believe that by placing them so close together, they will neutralize each other. When that happens, Unicron's body will automatically close around his spark chamber and move him into a hibernation mode at what it perceives as a lethal assault. That has no obvious countermove. It would normally then wait until the threat can be verified, gone, before waking him. However, we're going to lock that part of Unicron into an infinite loop so that it can't perceive the passage of time. He looked up and across. Maximo and Vector will manage that together. Yeah. What happens to Thirteen, then, if Unicron shuts down? Won't his spark be turned out? Solus peered at the larger forms of Alchemist and Nexus. She was ready to be angry at the idea of sacrificing someone. At her side, Thirteen frowned in concentration, imagining his role. Well, yes, it will, Alchemist said rather awkwardly. But it will survive, because Unicron will shield his spark instantly. Then all we need to do is retrieve Thirteen, and we can restart him. He'll be down and out, but he won't be dead. And with Unicron in hibernation, there'll be no issue with the rescue. At that point, we can just walk out. Theoretically, said Quintus, looking up from his calculations. He meant to be comforting, I think. He found it comforting at any rate. He had great faith in facts and figures, and I can probably jolt him out of it he said, indicating the small amulet-sized bag that he wore around his neck, and patted the ember stone inside it. Thirteen nodded steadily. All right, sounds plausible. If he was phased at the idea of killing himself briefly, he didn't look it. He saw the sense of the plan. He approved of it. The chance of it being his last act seemed almost not to cross his mind, although I am sure it must have. That sounds suicidal. Maximo said, coming up to us. I like it. Brave, daring, and just slightly tinged with insanity. What could possibly go wrong? Shut it, Gobby, Onyx said behind him, poking him in the side with a claw in a friendly but reproving way. Maximo did shut it, but he looked satisfied. Once that had been settled, all we had to do was practice and make a few contingency plans. We constructed an energy matrix with the assistance of our new computer, Sigma, which would be stored within the body of Primus. It would be a primary memory core into which all of our experiences as living things would be copied faithfully in case we did not return from the battle. Whoever would lead us after our duty was done would be able to draw upon it at any time, whether the Thirteen were present or not. Later, this energy matrix came to be known as the Matrix of Leadership, although the Thirteen did not give it this name. As soon as he was satisfied that we could only make variations and no improvements, Primer gathered us together. Twilight was falling over the long, plated plains of Primus's flank. 
the last slow golden lines of sunset, trailing the gantries and spires of the practice arrays. Assemble your weapons, ready yourselves, he said. It is time. Within a few cycles we have gathered, fully loaded and eager for battle. We will assume that our appearance will be a surprise. Solus and the free agents, take your point position. Warriors with me, saboteurs, you will wait the full count before entering the portal regardless of whatever you see and hear. Do you understand? As one, we solemnly nodded. Whatever personal issues we had developed over the cycles were forgotten now. We had only our targets in mind, our survival. It was a good feeling, a great feeling, this brotherhood. Vector, Prima said, turning to that prime who stood apart on the rise of the heights, staring into the night sky. Do you have a coordinate lock? Yes. Then open the gate when you are ready. Onyx growled softly, unable to help himself, but otherwise we all stayed silent. There could be no warnings. Vector waited until Onyx had stopped rumbling, and then, with a twist of his mandala, a huge arch of space opened up on the plain before us, shimmering like a curtain of light through which we could dimly glimpse strange constellations. Then we caught our first sight of the enemy. A vast monster clawed around a small moon in the throes of some indescribable feasting. He was an obscene industrial nightmare, smoke oozing from his stacks, raw energies radiating their excess out of him in bursts and pulses of light, belches of gases briefly flaring into fires or spitting out of his joints in sprays of obscene wastage. The moon's remains glowed under him as he ripped it apart, releasing all the pent energy that had held it intact. He broke off a sizable chunk and flung it away, searching for something closer to the core, though what I could not imagine, some mineral or element he wanted. A shiver ran through us all, exultant, terrified, determined. I have not felt so alive before or since that moment. I can feel it as if it happened only a cycle ago. And then Solus raised her sword and the forge, one in each hand, and with the sword gestured a strike, firmly, forward, and she began to run towards the portal. Into the dark. The free agents flowed with her, hot on her heels, their formation exacting, thirteen bringing up their rear, unrecognisable in his armour and under the weight of all the gear he was carrying, though he bore it lightly. The warriors flanked them in their own pattern, so that they entered just behind the first pack and vanished across the gulf of space that only Vector could understand. We saboteurs all silently began our count, fixated on the vague sights that shimmered back and forth in such frustrating incompleteness through the gate. We saw the beast turn, the first sign of combat. Micronus clung to Quintus' shoulder, nearly falling off as he craned forward. With a nod, Vector passed through his own creation to take his place with the warriors. And then we were alone. We could always just not go, Maximo said conversationally. Quintus struck him across the back of the head. Or we could just totally stick with the plan. I was just saying. Maximo rolled his eyes and rubbed his skull. Could you hit harder next time? Only I still have a few circuits left functioning here. But then he was cut short as we all, even he, surged forward into the veil and passed on into the unknown. What happened next was a blur for each one of us and seemed to take only microcycles, though it lasted far longer than that. We came out into hell. The first thing that hit us was the wave front of dark energon emanating from the hulk of Unicron's body. The most obvious and simple of his defences, but one that no simulation could ever have given a taste of. Even through the armouring and in the knowledge it was coming, nothing could have prepared us for the sheer shattering assault of its alien frequencies, screaming instantly inward along every nerve and every channel. The shock was so intense that I felt my conviction falter instantly. Oh no, it was not possible to act inside this nightmare. Every part of my being screamed for me to escape immediately for the sake of my life. But ahead of me, 
I could already see Megatronus, lined in purple, shooting straight for Unicron's blazing eyes, and the sight hardened my resolve. Off to a high angle and closer in, we saw Primer swing the Star Saber in a slice that sent purple energy and light spraying liquid out into space in a huge arc as it struck true into Unicron's shoulder. And then, clutched to the back of Unicron's neck, the winged savage form of Onyx, all blades and claws and teeth shredding and tearing huge chunks from the vulnerable armouring between the plates. He paused, flinging a section aside, and screeched through the gaping mouth of Predator, the hunter's mask. His cry rallied the others so they moved faster, dodging the sudden blue and white beam that shot out of Unicron's gaze towards them. Then Unicron reached up and seized Onyx in one colossal fist, trying to tug him out of his body by main force, regardless of damage. Onyx screamed differently then, but we couldn't wait to see the outcome. Primer was diving forward, Megatronus restabilising his guns and bearing on target. Thirteen, flinging his burst grenades right into that annihilating stare. Because we had to reach Vector's ever-shifting position for him to relay us to our posts. I couldn't stop my amazement. We had engaged. The first pass was completed. And we were still alive. Vector opened micro-portals into Unicron's interior. Solus went first with a defiant scream and vanished before us. We nearly all died then as a stream of black missiles came hurtling silently towards our position. Energon seekers that we had to scatter to avoid and then counter with whatever weapons we had. We scrambled for responses, for shielding, suddenly disorganised, but with enough missile avoidance practice in our bodies that they worked without thought and deployed our chaff flares and dummy targets in time to reroute at least three of them. My Cronus managed to pull one of them off of a fumbling Quintus by darting away in a burst of Energon, although it was against the plan. I shot it down with a beam gun, but in doing so, winged Vector, seeing him curse me even as I realised what was happening, too late. But he was not badly damaged, and we regrouped to reach the next point in our carefully designed avoidance pattern, just in time to fling Maximo through to his position. More missiles came, and another search beam, violent blue, where it touched anything. It sliced off half the weapons that Alchemist was carrying in one easy, silent stretch. He cursed, partly in fear, partly regret, as their useless casings fell away. They floated slowly towards the surface of the Eaton Moon, and we burned our jets away in panic. Scenes of the fighting elsewhere came to me in brief glimpses as I tore to my coordinates. Beyond the moon's disintegrating surface, the warriors continued to distract and harry, their jetpacks and rockets blasting them around with fierce bursts of gas that vanished almost instantly into the starving emptiness of the space around us. Onyx floated, broken, leaking energon from a dozen places, but Primer was near him, defending him. Megatronus and Thirteen executed their programmed manoeuvres, shouting across the comm, their mouths moving in silence from where I stood as they danced around Unicron's savage assaults. Their reactions and their agility amazed even me. Meantime, Amalgamus sneaked around for a surprise assault from the back, hiding himself behind debris that Unicron had spat out, darting from spot to spot like a streak of flowing mercury. Then... Unicron roared, and his voice was like a fall of rock. Do you think you will best me, little robots? I grow tired of your antics. Die and be done. He paused, and I assumed something had happened internally to him. His gaze searched around, looking I realised, for us. You're up, Alpha, Vector said as if nothing were happening. His steady voice brought me out of my daze. You will not prevail, Unicron screamed and unleashed from his whole skin surface what I can only describe as a shock front, though to this day I don't know what it was made of. Now, Vector pushed me hard, the wave must have hit him just after, but I was gone already, inside the depths of Unicron himself, and so protected from whatever it did. 
I materialised in a space so cramped it broke my foot immediately. The frequency shift of energy in here was intolerable, making everything a red ocean of agony, although physically that was not the worst. I faced what we had suspected might happen in our darker moments. Unicron's overpowering convictions were part and parcel of his being. He was so much greater than I was, so much more powerful. His will assaulted my own and effortlessly turned it over from positive to negative. Instantly, I lost all my nerve, laughed out loud at the stupidity of our hubris. Of course we could not win. Unicron was unstoppable, as powerful as a god. We were merely chattels for him to use or abuse as he saw fit. And moreover, he was right to do it. He and Primus themselves were living examples of the futility and stupidity of mortal suffering and the burdens of conscious thought. Better to end these ravings and thrashings and find peace in the silent eternity of death. This was the corruption of Unicron. Pretending to have it attack you was one thing, having it do so, another. Only the millions of repetitions of the drill I had learnt kept my hands moving in spite of what my mind was thinking or the despair I was feeling. Doing that took all the resources I had. But in the middle of it, I felt my hands start to falter as they found the lines that joined part of his neural net to his left weaponry array. What was the point even of this little gesture of defiance? Then, unexpectedly, I heard Thirteen's voice in my mind, crackly and broken through the comm, but still unmistakable. He did not sound even remotely ruffled. His voice was strong, but above all it was kind. In a sea of loathing and spite, it stood out like a spear of light, contradicting the perverse, self-destructive statements in my mind, soothing my hopelessness with its simple words. All are one. I understood then that whatever the outcome might be, and however it felt, it was for me to act as if I, and not Unicron, were master of the universe. He and I were not separate, and if he could act, I could too. He had become despair itself, longing for chaos and endings, while we primes and our maker were the other side of the same coin, hopeful and looking forward to order and resolution. Neither was greater than the other. Both must exist if either existed. I was his equal. My hands resumed their business, flying through it easily. Unicron lost the use of his arm. For a moment gone, almost before it began, I saw beyond the duality of the Broken Brothers in a place of possibilities that Thirteen had so aptly named everything. Everything was one. The results of all actions came to everyone. The necessity for all actions came from everywhere. The world, as I saw it, reduced itself to easy, simple matters. Open this. Connect this instrument. Check power on. Ramp up energon supply. I accepted Unicron's greater power and his hatred, just as Thirteen did. I didn't try to resist it. I let it be. And in turn, its grip on me fell loose and then away. I finished my chores, applied the correct voltages, and felt Unicron lurch and stagger as the results flooded his system. I may not have turned the battle, but I had done what I came to do. I moved to my next chore, maintaining the disruption. In their far distant cubbyholes of agony, the same story played out in Solus, Nexus, all five of him, Alchemist and Micronus. Far from the imagined games, as far as hell from heaven, we executed our duties with numb spite. And then, one by one, as Thirteen spoke to us, instead of sitting and waiting for death, we looked about us for some more useful mischiefs. It was so inglorious and so peaceful. I think that's what made me laugh the most. Unicron could easily have beaten us, and we knew it. But thanks to Thirteen, we had each won our own fight within him. Not this Unicron, the lurching monstrosity around us, but the Unicron inside us, to whom we had almost given up all our power. Unicron assaulted us with visions. I saw myself melted to slag, my ideas vanished with my processes. The others each had their torment. 
he mocked us, promising that either our corruption and ending or our lives would both be hells from which there was no exit. He showed us successful, glorious, our visions coming to fruition over a long future, and it was meaningless, pointless, all came to nothing as the universe ceased to exist. It had never mattered. He filled our minds with this, in image after image, and he was laughing. We could feel it. My Cronus cackled over the comm. Long as we're together, he ain't a bad place to be. Overload this! For a split second, there was a scream of shearing metal and the burning stink of boiling heavy elements that came gushing through the vents, almost choking me on their poison. I smiled, even so. Meanwhile, not everyone had even made it to their bases. Quintus and Maximo were both off course, having been teleported to the wrong coordinates because Unicron had moved so fast while they were in transit. They were temporarily reduced to some hacking and slashing antics at anything they could lay their hands on, but they persevered. They were the luckier ones. Outside Unicron's body, the shockwave had nearly finished the others off with one move. Disrupting all functions, it had sent them into seizures. Primer lost the Star Saber in his convulsions, and it went spiralling away from him, far up and out across the moon's dusty surface, falling so slowly it looked like a glinting feather. Only the work of the saboteurs had prevented Unicron dispatching the warriors immediately. As it was, he jerked and spasmed, his body made and remade by the ferocious strikes of the forge and the frenetic madness of his own immune system scraplets. By the roaring force of his garbled words, we gathered that Liege Maximo was having a conversation with him. Never one to even attempt to restrain himself, Unicron had already lost his temper and was half-focused on locating and killing Maximo first, out of sheer hatred for whatever it was that Maximo was saying in that laconic drawl of his. The beast stood, internally focused, clawing at his own neck, stabbing his massive fingers into the gaps in his bodywork in an effort to crush Maximo, shots of EMP and radioactive poison pouring out of his hand. It must have hurt him. It's not your fault, we heard through the static as Maximo spoke in terms of smooth reason. We don't even want to kill you. Now, have you ever thought about relocating to a different galaxy? There are some very attractive places out there, chock full of empty, just perfect for a sensitive being like yourself. I could sell one to you for a very reasonable price. Then Megatronus, tumbling out of control, his finger rigid on the Requiem Blaster's trigger, shot Vector through the middle, just as he managed to correct his rotation. Thirteen, dazed, weapons lost, ended up beside Amalgamus, who, of all the exposed primes, was the only one not severely affected. His form shifting was so frequent anyway that the shock didn't disrupt him much at all, and he recovered almost instantly. He grabbed Thirteen and made himself into a rocket, speeding over to Vector, where they both used hastily their last medical skills to patch up the smoking hole in Vector's middle. Mercifully, they drifted into Unicron's shadow as the beast went in pursuit of more visible prey. He set his sights on the helpless Primer, advancing upon him even though he had one hand still stuck at his neck with purple liquid dripping freely between his fingers. Looks like this is our moment. Your chance is now. Amalgamus whispered, taking a hold of Thirteen and moulding his hands into the calipers of a mighty booster bot. Thirteen nodded, and they looked at Vector, who flickered in and out of consciousness. Thirteen put his hand down into Vector's arm. Just one more, he said. Then you can rest. Energon and other liquids were beading out of Vector's body. The hole blackened right through him and was quarterized, But other organs had suffered too. If he could not make the jump for Thirteen, then we had no chance. But at the sound of Thirteen's voice, his eyes flickered open. His mouth smiled. Weakly, he took hold of Thirteen's arm, and in response, turning his dimmed gaze towards Unicron. The beast was now crouched over his prize of a stranded primer, the limp body of Onyx recaptured in his free hand, which was rising, 
rising to smite. Amalgamus ripped a patch cable out of his armour cavity and rammed it into Vector's arm port. Yeah, juice up and get this guy into place. The big guy's busy chomping on primer and a side of onyx. Just one down payment of a year or two's supply of energon. Maximo's voice faded in and out non-stop. Megatronus still spinning, still floating, still convulsed on the trigger of the Requiem blaster, made a lucky revolve so that the blaster beam waved across Unicron's left arm and severed it at the elbow, leaving it stuck by the hand to his neck. Dark energon retaliation came toward Vector and his helpers in fusillades, but the downward blow to kill Primer was stopped as Unicron launched missiles and braced himself to gear for a second shot front. We could not survive another. Vector, jacked into a bit of life by the connection of Amalgamus's spark energy, formed a portal, and together he and Amalgamus pushed Thirteen through it with all their remaining might, as if the impetus would help him. Afterward, spent, they lay in the dark rain of debris and dust churned from the lunar battlefield and tried to turn to see what would happen. Amalgamus watched, forming himself into a protective cage around Vector as Vector closed his eyes and connected to Maximo. Maximo, I hope you have access. The time is now. Liege Maximo's voice was slow, slurred and dull as he replied, heavily poisoned, but he seemed on the verge of oblivion or insanity. Equal payments. Got it right here. Unfulfillable conditions. No loop counter. No exit logical eternity. The space of a cycle. I'll loop you, Vector murmured, trying to growl. Access the cycle counter and replace it. Unicron, finding himself in a lull, put primer into his mouth, turned and reached for his severed arm and stuck it back into place. He crunched Primer and spat him out hard into the pale moon dust. On the remains of the comm, we all heard Maximo swearing as he struggled to obey complex instructions from Vector. Vector's hissed replies and then Thirteen's quiet voice. I am here. His spark is before me. At that point, our comm went dead. Unicron hesitated, clutching his chest, then apparently decided it was not a problem and carried on roaring fury. And then he stopped. Between one cycle and the next, he simply ceased. The entire dark energon field and all his activities shut down. There was a strange moment of noise and fury from my perspective. Scraplets scattering, systems screaming through emergency shutdowns, although if seen from the outside, I would have known he was, in fact, alt-forming into the same planetary body shape that Primus had taken in stasis. His lights dimmed and went out. And so, scattered, broken, helpless, despairing, surrendered, we won. After a time, we slowly regrouped, the wounded helped by those in slightly better shape in a limping convoy that took a long journey home in tiny jumps as Vector gained and lost consciousness. But we were all present. Against the odds, we all survived, at least for now. And we made it to Cybertron at last, and lay there under the familiar sun, silent and sombre, in the glory of our victory. We could not forget, each of us, how we had fallen so quickly and easily to the dark. We had dreamed of winning, but not what it would cost. And we were different from that moment onward. Each of us disappointed in ourselves, in our own ways, confused by the interior nature of the war that we had supposed would be dealt with in rage, justice and physical might. 
we had seen other realities and lost our innocence forever. In doing so, we had stepped beyond our progenitors, though we did not realise it at the time. <laughs>